All right, so we are on Collins Conversations. I always let the guests introduce themselves. Go ahead and let everybody know your name, a little bit about what you do and what brought you here, and we'll go from there. All right, yeah, uh, my name is B. Jeff. Um, I guess I'm like a hip-hop musician, artist, uh, from originally from DMV. Uh, now I'm residing in Columbus, Ohio. Um, actually, I found out about your podcast through uh, Jamil Michaud, who was on the podcast uh, at some point. Um, that's a homie of mine, collaborator, long-time collaborator and stuff like that, so yeah. Excellent. And uh, you didn't come all the way from Columbus today, did you? Yeah, actually I did. That's badass. We're not going to mention this episode. It's completely epic. I, I'd be kicking myself if we got out of here and I didn't find out. I'm always interested in how musicians come up with their stage name. How did okay. you come up with B.Jeff? <laughs> so, um, my government name is Wade Jeffrey Blair II. Um, my father, I'm named after my father, so my father's the first. The reason why his name is Wade is because uh, my late grandmother, his mom, her maiden name was Wade. So literally keeping the name in the family kind of deal, naming my dad Wade, which is why they called, actually called my dad Jeff gotcha. his entire life until he went to college and when people knew him as Wade instead of Jeff. And so my grandma would call me Baby Jeff as like her nickname for me because gotcha. like I'm just a little my little dad you know what I'm saying but they didn't Lil Wade was one that stuck a lot and like she would call me baby Jeff um and as I, I've been through quite a few artist names uh I've changed my name a lot because uh, I could never find one that stuck until now and originally it was baby Jeff spelled out and I was like I'm not gonna be like Birdman and be called baby my entire life. That would suck. <laughs> and so I changed it to B dot Jeff, but it was supposed to be pronounced B Jeff, like literally B period Jeff. But everyone just kept saying B dot Jeff, just call me B dot. Right. Um, and every time they look up my music, they'd be like, man, I can't find it because I'm typing in B dot Jeff, but like right. spelling dot all out instead of putting a period. And Eventually, I changed my spelling to B. Jeff with asterisks, but then uh, nobody wanted to type out two asterisks right. every time they type out an artist name. So I rebranded it, took out the asterisks, and it's all spelled out B. Jeff. So that way, it also matches all of my social media and everything like that too. So like, literally B. Jeff three zero one all spelled out, and I can just say that every right. single time. I and then the three hundred one, that's the Maryland zip code. Yep, and this is the area code. I mean, yeah, yeah, area code where I'm from. Yep, right. I, I, fi I figured that out, but then I was like, how does he get be d d Jeff yeah. out of Wade? You know, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah, my middle name is Jeffrey and like it's a whole family thing. Yep. Puts it all together. And uh, I don't know if you caught our last episode, but I've been giving gifts lately for the okay, for podcast good. gifts. So you came at the right time. Jamil did not get gifts when he <laughs> showed up. So we got two gifts for you. We'll start off with this one. Okay, sweet, sweet. Oh, hey, that's tight. It's a custom Collins Conversation bottle opener. Um, hey. It's made out of uh, stainless steel. You can leave that outside and nothing will ever happen to nice. it. Nice. Uh, Twisted Willow was on our episode like 1820, somewhere in the earlier episodes. And they're a metal fabricator out of uh, upstate New York. Okay. So a uh, couple collaborations back and forth. And next thing you know, those are at my doorstep. And I was like, oh. What am I going to do with 40 bottle openers? Yep. You know, I was like, oh, every guest, let's give everybody a little something to go away with. Nice, nice. Awesome. And then, uh, I don't know if you caught episode 50 or something, um, but you like CBD? Yeah. Here's some free CBD. Oh, nice. Hell yeah. Um, EnviroStar Ingredients sent us a bunch of CBD, um, a couple different varieties. They're, they don't actually sell the CBD themselves, but if you're ever looking for, say, a $100,000 mm -hmm. extractor to make uh, water-soluble THC, they got gotcha. you. Okay, nice, um, nice, nice. But luckily, Roxanne Diedrich was on the podcast, and she was a great lady to talk to. Check that one out after you sample that. But that stuff's great for mind, body. They're not a paid sponsor or anything, but if they people give me free stuff, I always like to pass it around. Oh, and yeah. let's spread, help spread, what better way to spread the word about companies than do a podcast and get their products out? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And people have been spreading the word about you. Um, we're going to word. the first time of this segment of video submitted questions. Uh, we had a couple of your fans, friends, I don't know, maybe we paged some people, who knows? But we had a bunch <laughs> of submissions. And there it is. Um, our first one goes out to uh, Hunter Brodus, I think. Is that right? Hunter Brodus. Brodus? Yeah. It's, so, it's funny, uh, him and uh, Snoop Dogg's uh, last names are pronounced the same. Gotcha. Now, I was looking at it, I was like, I wonder if they're related. They, they, <laughs> they, they look identical, everybody. Let me yeah, the, uh, Snoop Dogg's missing a D in his. Uh, Hunter's actually just a, a white dude <laughs> from right. Maryland. He's a homie of mine. He's a baker and all that stuff. A baker, nice. Yeah. 
All right, so let's pull this up. Colin, I hope your conversation is going well. I've got two questions for B.Dot Jeff. First, what was the most tedious part of recording the album? Like, what just made you groan at the end of the day? Uh, and second, what food lifts you up, like, from a bad day? Like, what makes you feel better? Uh, like, without a doubt. Uh, that's that. Wear your masks, stay healthy, all love. So awesome. That, so that was two questions. What was the most tedious part about the making the album, and what food makes you uh, smile, it sounds like? Um, the, tedi the most tedious part about making the album uh, most likely was getting the correct sound samples that I wanted um, because being a solo artist and like producing most of the stuff myself um, I didn't have the necessary like certain drum samples that had like the correct sound that I wanted for everything so like I ended up having to uh, trash and redo a ton of stuff like uh, Shadows there's like nine, ten different versions of that song out there somewhere. Jade Roses has probably like seven different versions nice. of it out there somewhere. Um, but yeah, and that's why I went up to X Diggity D, or Diggity D is how you're supposed to pronounce it, but that's why I uh, collabed with him on it, because uh, he had a lot of sounds, and like he is a former drummer too, so that ended up working out really well in that regard, because um, I didn't have to struggle with that for a lot longer than I uh, actually had planned that I'd be struggling with it. Nice. And uh, food that makes me happy. I feel uh, like that's some sort of inside, inside joke there or something, or something um, between you guys. I mean, I guess. I mean, I really like sushi. Sushi is my favorite food. So, like, any anybody that's friends with me know that sushi is my favorite food. Period. Um, specifically, uh, I like eel rolls a lot. Eel cucumber rolls or eel uh, eel uh, avocado rolls are really dope. Right. No, nothing's better than the uh, next time you're up in this area. Pacific East has the best uh, sweet potato roll. Okay. It's got like a slight bit of a crunch. Like I could eat all day for most foods. I could eat like two orders of that and I'm completely mm. stuffed. It's like the perfect level of stuff. Nice. Um, but sushi's always good. Let's go into our next one. Tyrell Compton, ring yeah, any bells? Yeah, yeah. Let's see what we got here. Hey, yo. What's up, B.Dot Jeff, the homie? <laughs> um, I had a question for you. So what were the top three songs that you were listening to while creating the project? And how did they influence the production while you were creating the project? Oh man, that's a that's a good one actually. So we're talking about the YK, YK2 project. Yeah. And uh, what do you got for them? Um, what's crazy is I was listening to a lot of albums. Uh, I guess like what I do is I will listen to like whole a whole playlist full of like albums mm -hmm. uh, that like inspire me that are like that I'm feeling at the time. So I guess I had to take it down to songs. Um, ooh, uh, definitely Jet Fuel by Mac Miller. Um, that was one of the main influences behind Warp Drive. I pretty much uh, took the same key for, as that song and like flipped it for myself. Ooh, uh, probably, man, probably uh, another Mac Miller song off of uh, Good AM. Um, oh, what is it? It's the, it's the one with uh, Schoolboy Q's like talking in a skit, uh, Perfect Circle. It's the really long one. It's like halfway through the halfway through the album, and then, man, uh, I'm gonna have to say probably like "Pothole" by Tyler Creator from Flower Boy. Gotcha. That uh, the Mac Miller one, the truck I've got out there will not play burnt CDs, and one of the few actual bought CDs I have is Good AM, and that's been playing on repeat in that truck for like a year and a half. Nice, nice. <laughs> that's one of my favorite. I figure if you're only going to have one one CD that keeps continually playing, you might as well be a good one, right? Yep, yeah, exactly. Who do we got next? Yeah, like a bunch of these came in in the last day or so. Yeah, I got a lot of texts telling me that they were sending stuff in. Uh, so this was a two-part submission from our good friend Jamil. Nice, nice. Hey, B.Dot Jeff, Colin Conversations. It's Jamila in the show. My question is, what song, if any, on the album means the most to you? Okay, what song on the album means the most to me? Um, man, that's hard to pinpoint down to one, but I guess if I really were to say one, Far away X, far away 10 broken. Um, mostly because I was going through a really, 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 really rough time in my life. That song was originally like six, seven minutes long and I had to chop it down to about three minutes, um, which is just the broken poem at the end. Um, originally, 
it was a super, 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 super personal song, way more personal than it ended up being. And then I realized, I even had to bleep some stuff out because I was like, I can't technically <laughs> tell people's business like that or say certain things. Um, but I ended up shortening that one down. Um, but that is probably like means the most to me, mostly because of the fact that these were like two, these are just two poems back to back that I was just like venting on about like just not liking where I was in life at the point in time. And like, uh, I feel like if I hadn't like gotten that out on like paper or even like on record, like it would, my mental state would not have been like the same at all. And I probably wouldn't have been able to like release this project. Cause like, that's really like that track being the climax of the album was really like the glue that kind of like put it all together as kind of a concept. Gotcha. And uh, when you say that it ha you had to shorten it, you had to cut off a couple minutes of it, is that just you felt it wasn't going to be people who didn't want to listen to a 10 minute song or what, when you say had to? Um, for one, I was actually, this uh, album around, I did a lot of uh, research with like how to market an album, what people would listen to, the lengths of songs, people like generally don't skip, things like that. and a uh, spoken word or a poem track that's about you know almost 10 minutes long right. most likely won't be getting a lot of listens right now because i shortened it a lot of people are listening to it way more than i thought it was um one of uh my collaborators happy to like that's one of his favorite tracks on the whole project which gotcha. is kind of crazy um because i thought because of how personal it would be people wouldn't like it as much, especially because it's not a song. Mm -hmm. That was a huge thing. Like the song structure behind it was like super loose. There was pretty much, there's no chorus. It was just a poem and poem. And, uh, and I wanted to create an album that didn't extend past 60 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to get it ideally less than 45 minutes or at the 45 minute mark. Um, and the album ended up being 44 when I cut it down. Uh, I cut a few songs down because a few songs ended up being a little bit longer than they uh, originally were, about a minute for each probably cut outside of Far Away. So yeah, that's, that was one reason why I wanted to actually have it be a more, I guess, personal commercial listen than uh, kind of like a passion project. Gotcha, that makes sense. And uh, we got one more from Jamil. Hey, B. Jeff, Colin, how's it going? It's Jamil in the show. My question for you is, what was it like working with another producer on all of the songs for the album? That man's never not smiling. Every yeah. It's <laughs> always that big grin. Yep. <laughs> um, what was it like? Uh, originally, I had to pretty much I, was, I did a lot of like contemplating on who I wanted to help me out with the production on it. Mm -hmm. um, I had the thought process of just being like, all right, I'm gonna send it all to Tyrell Fanaticus since I work with him so much. I even thought about just sending the whole thing to Jamil and having Jamil work on it. Um, but ultimately I was like, well, I work with these guys all the time. I wanna work with someone more outside of the genre, outside of my contemporaries that I normally work with or that like I have, I don't even listen to. Right. And so, uh, Diggity D or Aaron Rigg, him and I go way back. We went to college together at Capitol and I had done a couple songs with him before. And when I first moved to Columbus, I had pretty much opened for him for his uh, release show for one of his albums. And so, I already had the relationship there and I just kind of was like, well, this dude literally hears per certain parts of the songs that I'm literally looking for someone else to have the ear to be able to hear. Right. And so I hit him up uh, and he pretty much was like set to go. So like, it was really weird at first because I thought we'd just be sending stuff back and forth. He'd take care of whatever right. and send me back. And then eventually we were like, we have to sit down in the same room together. Stuff will not get done. It'll take way too long. So I brought him the stems, we sat down, and originally I thought I was being like, I had to like tell him like, yo, if I'm like straight up being too bossy, like kind of like being a dick about this, like, it, like you can tell me and let me know, cause like, yeah, I know it's like my music and I know you're a musician too, so you know we're kind of sensitive about our shit, like right. so it's kind of funny that uh, if you, you know, don't want to say anything, but I totally understand if you like, I'm being a dick and he was pretty much like, no, I agree with a lot of the stuff you're like, a lot of your sentiments. So a lot of it was like a huge communication barrier that like we had to break down one day after like working on a few songs, it's kind of just like, all right, 
I need to know where you're at mentally. You need to know where I'm at mentally on this project, and so that we can work together right. like in more uh, fluid motion. And like from there, like we were cranking things out. It was like pretty interesting, mostly because I had all the melodic stuff done, and I just really needed him to rework all my drums. And pretty much a lot of the stuff he kept telling me is like, man, these pockets are pretty much there. I'm just gonna be taking some stuff out, changing some sounds around, and then he added some transitions in. It was like pretty seamless once we got through that barrier. That's awesome. A lot of your music is real. You can tell it's a real personal thing. So I could kind yeah. of see you kind of taking that. You know, this is how it needs to be done. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's funny too how you mentioned how you're do, already doing research to see how things would be better received. But yet, m my impression from your music is like it's more of a therapeutic release, more mm -hmm. so than looking for that commercial gratification. Yeah. Um, I would say that yeah, definitely, uh, especially because. I don't really, I'm not really looking, I just love, I love commercial music, that's really right. what it is. I love the sound of like the lush vibes, you know, like piano, like chords that are like, everyone uses, um, same certain progressions that like every hip hop sample has ever used, period. Like there are certain things that I'm just like, man, I want to flip that in my own way. Kind of like, uh, honestly, kind of, kind of like a Donald Glover kind of situation mm -hmm. where he likes to take popularized sounds and just kind of like make them as weird as possible and experiment on top of like an already existing like sound. Gotcha. That makes sense. And uh, our last one, we got a couple other ones, but then just to keep everything rolling, our last one is coming from, uh, I need your help with this one, Sean Pug? Who? Sean Pew. Pew. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Former bandmate. Sweet. Questions? What's your Mount Rushmore for uh, rock and metal rap acts? And, uh, when are we collaborating? So that's your Mount Rushmore <laughs> for metal Ooh, rap yep, collabs. Yep. And when are you guys collaborating? Okay. Um, man. So, okay. So Rage Against the Machine, number one. Uh, Lincoln Park. Um, two more. I really like Fever 333 right now. They're like kind of like a newer act. Um, it's the vocalist. Um, Oh my goodness! It's a it's a band that just pretty much they just retired and then he pretty much made a new band immediately after it. Um, they're really dope. Uh, um, uh, what's that? Uh, man, uh, Fort Minor. That's what it is. Gotcha. Yeah, when Mike Shinoda does the Fort Minor stuff, I love like the way he incorporates um, Styles Beyond and like a bunch of other like extra like rock metal stuff into his uh, music that like you wouldn't ever hear it in like hip hop and like a normal like radio setting. Right. That's uh, and then you, you skipped the last. One. Oh yeah, and when we man, when when you trying to hit me up, like I'm ready to go whenever you know. I, I got I got the computer, I got a new mic and everything, man. You know, I'm I'm set to go. Uh, just let me know when you're ready to go. And there it is. <laughs> so that concludes our first ever video uh, mashup. This one that we're going to do is called Discography Discussions. I'm sure you've seen a couple of these yep. on the on the page. <laughs> I actually just watched the Doobie Rogers one this morning. How'd you like it? Uh, I really liked it. Yeah, I liked how he like uh, he did his explanations and everything. I really liked how introspective he was on that. Yeah, Do Doobie's a very introspective dude. Yeah. Um, the, the, the one of the funniest things that stuck out when I was editing all that is when I asked him. I don't think it was in the Discography Discussions. I think it was in the full length one. I was like, yeah. You know, have you ever been anywhere internationally? And he stood by it that Hawaii is international. <laughs> like, I know, I know that it's part of the U.S., but it's such a different vibe. <laughs> it's such a different everything. I, I, I get what he's saying. I totally yeah. get what he's saying. But yeah. you're like, he was just not not going back on that one. Yeah. I, I respected that for sure. So within the discography discussions, kind of like you saw in his, the whole idea is I'm going to go through, um, we're going to go through the whole YK2, and then mm -hmm. we got a couple little singles I pulled out that okay. I think could kind of. Just give us the backstory, you know, who, who produced it, how long did it take, why, what does that mean to you, any special references that people, you know, the behind the music for the fans, That's why right. you're still alive and you haven't, you know, ruined your life with drugs or anything like that. <laughs> Um, the first one on it is uh, Welcome. It's mm -hmm. a, what, about an eight second, just kind of a PSA almost. Yeah. Uh, what made you feel that you needed that introduction to it? W uh, going with uh, part of the learning how to do, like, pretty much sculpt an album in a way that's more listenable in terms of like a, uh, I guess, l for making it a loose concept to a bigger concept, I created, not created, but really I wrote out a letter to myself um, back in 2018, 2019. In the start of this, it's a whole like long message. If you take uh, every little skip, 
uh, I guess they're skits, but you know, a little snippet that I have of me just talking, no music in between like certain parts of the uh, album, and you put them together on top of the welcome, it's one long uh, phrase, one long sentence pretty much, and uh, it's pretty much just part of the glue that sticks it together, it has all the songs like, you know, right. make sense on top of each other with how crazy different they sound. Gotcha, so it's kind of just that, that binding piece. Yeah. Of, did, did you already go through the whole thing and think something's missing or did you kind of already go through it from the from the gate when you already had those um so what's funny is the i had most of the songs um including some extras that didn't make the cut and then i originally had the orders completely different i wrote sarah landing last the very last song i wrote last um, that originally was going to be the first song and it was almost going to be a YK2 ends it So like the last song would be mm. first and like it would go through in a different kind of order um, But I decided that I wanted to tell more of the actual I guess feelings from me moving from the DMV from moving from Maryland all the way to Columbus and like why I was like moving mm -hmm. um, So then that short intro then we go into summer snow. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us about that? Summer Snow was actually the very first song that I wrote for the project. Um, I wrote it back in 2018. Um, not that long after Mac Miller's death. Um, I was going through it really rough all around that time in general. And then like his death on top of it was not the greatest thing for me mentally. Uh, him right. being one of my favorite artists and everything. So I originally had that beat produced back in... 2017 I think 2017 and so I finally was like well I have something to write to it because I like I like this beat and I originally was gonna sell it but I like it so much and I actually have something in my head for it now that I'm just gonna go ahead and write to it uh, originally it was just the first three verses there was no bridge there was no fourth verse um, but there was a section for it and originally I was going to have uh, Tyrell Fanaticus go on the fourth verse um, but instead he pretty much back off the verse and said, I'll sing some ad-libs for you instead, but I think you should just take that fourth verse for yourself. And it took me a few months to write it, but it, I finally got it down and I wrote the fourth verse for it, so it's pretty much how that came to be. It's uh, about uh, pretty much the beginning stages of me wanting to run away from my problems, pretty much due to uh, my like mental health and stuff. I, depression, anxiety, all that kind of stuff. So I'm thinking, okay, the key to me not being as depressed would be like to get out of the situation I'm currently in. Like move, change states, gotta be somewhere else, live somewhere else. Um, and that was pretty much like me making the decision that like, man, nothing ever goes right. I gotta go somewhere. Mm -hmm. Dancing with depression. So Dancing with Depression uh, is the, I would say is the one song Actually, no, it was one of the two songs on there that uh, I produced way, just completely different, had a completely different mindset of like when I like made the like instrumentation, like when I like com composed like the whole thing. Um, I'd been listening to a lot of Smino around the time and I was like, man, how does Monte Booker do that? Or Monty Booker do that? I always say Monte, I got cousins named Monte. I <laughs> mess that up all the time. But I was like, man, how does he like do, how does he make his like production sound the way it does? And a lot of it has to do with like, this man uses Foley. Like just random like pins dropping, um, closing, opening the door, turning knobs, like keys jingling. He uses a lot of foley in his like production, which is gives it like a more I guess sense of area. Like you feel like you're in a room, right? Uh, next to like you know with all like the processing and stuff with like reverb and everything. And so I uh, I pretty much <laughs> I asked, went back to Tyrell and Jamil and I asked them, but man. Like, do y'all hear y'all hear what I'm hearing, right? Like, what do you, what does he do? And Tyrell sent me some stuff back. I was like, yo, this kind of like what Monte or Monte does. And like Jamil sent me like a couple of videos. Like, hey, he does like some breakdowns here. And that was like, I would through that. Um, I kind of like learned how to incorporate more acoustic sounds with the digital sounds. And uh, I went to the homie Happy Tooth, uh, whose name is also Colin. Uh, Happy Tooth Colin, I like yeah. it already. <laughs> and uh, I always wanted to collab with him. I had met him uh, not that long after I originally moved to Columbus. Uh, he's actually the brother of someone I went to school with at Capitol as well. And through that, uh, and like performing with him at the same like places a couple of times, seeing him like live, uh, pl uh, playing with like like opening 
for his band or I was getting ready to open for his band um, but like we had like done like you know shows and stuff together and I'd seen him at like around the place and like I finally like asked him hey man you want to do this project and he was like I've been waiting for like this collab for like forever because he apparently he apparently was also a fan of my music too and was, we were just like awkward just the one we're waiting for each other so that's a song that's relatively about um the actual move um the whole pop the cork now I'm the man at 23 had my whole life planned tripped on now I won't now I no longer stand that whole like concept of like uh man I think I'm making big moves I'm gonna do this I'm gonna do that and then when you like you're out there you realize oh wow the struggle is real you don't just get to the point just because you move to that place there's still like a lot of work to be done um so even if that's you know like a physical plane of existence you know uh, a mental like state of like progress and when you're like mental state or like even like with relationships and there being like you know trial and tribulations with that and you know dealing literally like living with another person having to deal with how they live and them dealing with you and all kind of stuff is like just because you move that one place, all your problems aren't gonna be solved, you know? Just because you have a kid, all your problems aren't gonna be solved. Right. Um, and I feel like a lot of people have that mindset of like, if I just do this one thing, I'll just be happy, and that's not how it works. Uh, and that's pretty much like me interluding into that, uh, to the rest of the project with that kind of like mindset of like, oh yeah, I'm gonna move, I'm gonna be the man, I'm gonna rule the world, and that might not, you know, be the case just because, you know, you move doesn't mean your problems are gonna be solved. Um, what made you go? What made you pick uh, Columbus? Was it just the Capital University, or uh, that was the main reason? Yeah. Um, also, doing music in the DMV area for like a solid year kind of made me realize that maybe my style of music lyrically was not the best uh, for that area. Because what's weird about the DMV hip hop scene, or in general the music scene versus the Columbus music scene, is in the DMV genres are very strict mm -hmm. so if you make trap music you're hanging out with the trap dudes and like your lyrics are about banging making money all that kind of stuff if you make like the stoner music your stuff kind of sounds like whiskey for your currency you guys tend to stay in that lane you do that kind of music you make those kind of beats um if you do stuff like more like out of the pocket it's kind of harder to find your audience out there because people are going to be probably looking at the one song that sounds like the song that they like uh, rather than over the whole project being like man the music overall is like insane because of how strict the genres are because even like go-go is just go-go in the dmv mm -hmm. it's not like you're in a go-go rock fusion band or like you know, I'm playing in a reggae band that kind of plays like some like, they do some metal like drumming riffs on the side or like some like crazy like breakdowns or something like that. Or like I'm adding like, you know, electronic music to like R&B or something like that. It's like really strict on how you do stuff and how like people are like, you know, promoted. Because if you sound too much, like too many different things, no one knows what to call you, right. who knows who to book you with. And out here in and out in Columbus, there's more of a, uh, I guess, encouragement on like breaking down like the whole like genre barriers and doing different stuff and like having like a funk song right next to an R&B song right next to uh, a mainstream radio a hip hop song right. next to you know a spitterific you know kind of like lyrical miracle spiritual song for sure you know. And like Columbus has been pretty like open with like how open I am with genre, basically just through the people I've met. The fact that like as soon as I came out here, I was playing shows. I like played a festival my first summer like living out of here in barbecue. So like that was kind of insane that like I even got booked for that right. last second. Um, so like yeah, it just seems like the brand of music that I make in Columbus just tends to be more well well received and not just more like little clicks liking it seems like overall once one person that likes a similar style likes this one they'll tends to gravitate towards like a more larger group of people who are looking for that sound right that makes sense you used to be a, you used to have a uh, your own heavy metal band too right um not heavy metal like post hardcore yeah like we're kind of like yeah yeah we're kind of like a, we consider ourselves post hardcore light um my homie Bela actually who plays all the guitar on the album um every single lick of guitar you hear that is that guy playing it um 
he's the one who got me into a, like the progressive music scene and like listen to progressive music mm. and like the whole like fuck genres kind of thing because his former band venus core was literally a band that like everyone called fusion he hated that name <laughs> he hated that like genre because like when you hear fusion you think a completely different thing than what they actually play so what they kind of played was closer to post-hardcore like uh the fall of troy hella sun dance gavin dance deftones um like the more mathy like progressive stuff that doesn't have a lot of song structure but you can tell when the chorus comes in because mm -hmm. like everything wells up to like one certain like point and all that kind of stuff and so him and i pretty much had a kind of still do have a duo um where he plays all the guitar bass lines and i like process the drums but right now we're really looking to try and like incorporate like more processed sense with acoustic drums um but like we yeah we're we're still a thing i guess kind of uh we're just work, we're working on stuff because uh we got a lot of like bigger things in store for that like gotcha. a lot of like bigger plans but um yeah we can like we collabed uh i guess like more our sound for that band would be probably like uh anything that says featuring west street so like we did something called uh if your father was a sorcerer or mine was a bassist on my 727 record and um Vic, uh, victoria weber interlude too on that as well and uh those are two like more post hardcore light songs like the style in which like we play and what we're going for with that so yeah and then uh before all that i think you started off with christians like a choir right? yeah yeah my um my dad kind of forced us to uh, be uh my middle brother and then eventually the youngest brother when he became old enough um and our two friends in the hope family will and case uh to be kind of like a uh, worship group like the children's worship choir because there was no children's worship choir so because you know that's a huge thing about the church is like they're trying to get the youth involved and that's right. a huge thing and so um my dad pretty much was like you're gonna do this <laughs> and we're just kind of like okay so we learned uh some songs uh we did some stepping um because both of our fathers are kappas kappa alpha psi um historically black fraternity and so they were just like you're gonna do this uh you guys don't have an option you're gonna praise the lord and thing if y'all want to do this music thing or if all like like music or at all cause, right yeah <laughs> it was pretty it was pretty uh it was a fun time but uh it was kind of hilarious because we would argue over the name of the group everyone wanted to call us the blair hope boys and us being not 50 we we're yeah. like that's not the name of a band that's not the name of a group so we wanted to be called new generation but no one ever wanted to call us that that's funny that's awesome so let's get back to the uh, yk2 project mm -hmm. the next one we got is uh, number four maybe slash doubt yeah um, I, I think this is the most catchy one on the project for sure yeah yeah everyone loves this joint so fun fact the first time i uh played this or like i, I introduced this song was during uh, a showcase called the beautiful showcase that we actually set up and did in the basement oh, of basement, my house right? yeah, yep. your house awesome. yep um so over the course of a month in like the month of january uh, a friend of mine jeremy beach helped build the stage and like we set everything up like uh into the room we built it outside of my garage and then like you know well transported it in it's actually a two-piece stage so like it uh comes up pretty much at the half you just nice. plop it down so it's like semi-permanent um and through that i pretty much played a and r i promoted the gig i like literally booked the show i booked the artists um i even had some trouble with an artist that like decided to cancel with, like two minutes before he was supposed to go on yeah. so we had the host fill in and like freestyle like his opening set for him for the first 15 minutes that went really dope people really liked that but uh maybe doubt was the that was the first time i ever played that was during that set uh or during that show during my set and it was so well received like uh, bela uh was or aka lugosi which is also the artist name he goes by uh he was hype about that song <laughs> the entire time he loves the uh whining like a baby wham ad lib like he loves that he loves that part he looks like oh man uh he, he got really hype about that so the whole concept behind that is i just wanted to make a trap banger for the album because i was like 
well, when I first moved, I mean, I was feeling like a man and I just don't have like a straight banger on here that's just like straight, you know, like almost egotistical, kind of like, you know, kind of like feeling myself. And so I wanted to make a song kind of actually about a song that ended up not making the project because the feature for it ended up not coming through. So I had uh, sent a song out to somebody and they had, they had been complaining like, man, why people always like ask me for features. And then when I ask you when the song's dropping, they don't ever like actually drop the song or say, ah, oh, I'm not too sure. I must be killing them on their own songs. And I was like, dude, I want to collab with you for a minute. You looking to collab and have that when someone actually release the song? I'll do that. Right. Didn't hear anything back for like two months and I had to move on with like Baby Down creating that song and pretty much it was more or less about like, man, people who say they're about that life and they're really not about that life. It's like, man, if, if I come at you about like wanting to do some work and you're just like, oh yeah, man, about that work, and you're just like, oh nah, I'm not too sure anymore, man. It's kind of like, whoa. Well, that must be because I'll body you in your own track, on my own track that you guys were just complaining about not having somebody come on for you with. So, right. Um, that one ended up coming out of like frustration, but I also just wanted to make a trap hanger too. I was just like, oh, I want to make something really catchy, really simple, straightforward. Yeah, it's definitely catchy. Like, uh, I was in there doing the, the cedar stuff mm -hmm. on the walls and I had the speaker out here, and just, you know, but just catching up on all my stuff just so I knew, you know, a little bit more, a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And every time on the loop of that project that I go around, that would be the one that caught my attention every mm -hmm. trip. Or the other ones, like, you know, if it was in there, it'd be far more on my mind. That one, every time, he's like, you can't, even, it's just like, all right. <laughs> like, yep. it just it takes over your body, like the way that the rhythm goes, for mm -hmm. sure. Next, we got uh, Who Me. What can you tell us about it? Um, so, the reason, actually, the reason why it's called Who Me Dream State um, is because originally when I made the album, uh, it's gonna be like a longer album, like 16, 18 tracks I was originally gonna, originally gonna do, and Dream State and Who Me were gonna be completely separate songs that went into each other, intertwined in some super complex way that I was gonna do it, and then I ended up, in the actual beat session itself, I decided I don't like the way Who Me sounds. <laughs> this sounds more like Dream State. So I just moved all the instruments to the, to the side, and I was like, I'm still gonna do it in the same key so that it like, melts together properly and uh when i made who me i was like all right i'm gonna pick the most random like lead synth sound that i can find found it it was like almost on like the first maybe second like instrument that i like found and i was like oh, okay that's the one and then like playing it out and everything and then i was like man i wonder i wonder what the new melody like lines sound like over top the old melody lines, and then eventually I just put them on top of each other, and I was like, oh, <laughs> that's the bridge, outro, like breakdown kind of like right there. And so, um, the con I, when, I, when I was making the, uh, the actual who me section, the more aggressive section, um, I got to the actually like structuring out the, the chorus, and I literally just kept saying like, who me? Like, who me? I'm like, oh, okay, that's, that's the chorus right there. I don't even, okay, I know what I'm gonna do. And then I pretty much uh, had just, I really like stopped everything, made the beat section to the chorus, wrote the chorus out, and I was like, all right, well, now I guess I, got, I should finish the song. Um, and I wanted another feature on it, and the, my original feature ended up also like uh, bailing on me. So I pretty much hit up uh, Tyro Fanaticus, because I was like, well, I know he'll hit me back for sure. And so um, he got back with me with a, with a verse after like a while, like a, the, the whole process took like, you know, a few months in general for like almost every song for the most part, unless I made it right then and there. Mm. Um, and so like I got his, I finally got his stuff back. Uh, and yeah, pretty much it's just, the song is about um, more or less in general, people doubting you, um, and you're just being like me. Really, like those those things that you're saying about me are very severely false. Uh, I definitely don't have a crap flow. Thank you, sir. Uh, but in general, like it's about like people like and, and just wanting to put you down because they don't feel good about themselves, and you're just like, mm, I don't feel like that's that's the truth right there. Uh, which is why the chorus is like when people uh, at the end it's like uh, they say, "Man is about to blow, 
yeah, that's me. You know, I say that, I say that line literally just because it's like you hear all like the negative stuff and then like that like once you, and then that one person that's like those few people that are just like, nah, man, like they they don't know what they're talking about once you get that actual like valid validation from like the people that you've been actually wanting to get the validation from. It's like, it doesn't even matter what these people are saying anymore. Like I can make jokes about you. Y'all talk about how I got a crap flow, man, y'all off beat on your own songs. Like that kind of like mindset of like, uh, I'm going to not believe what you're saying about me just because I know the people that I actually care about right. are going to, are giving me the validation, which goes literally into like dream state being a kind of like an entendre on top of itself. Like I'm living in this dream state, like, yeah, the people who are giving me validation are the ones I want validation from, but at the same time, they're still my peers. I'm still like same level as I was before just because I got that validation doesn't mean that I'm like the next Jay-Z or the next Kendrick Lamar or anything like that at all um but also it means I'm living in like this dream state of like this is where I want to be I want people to like feel that way about my music the way that these people are like the people I want validating me have been validating me and so it's like you can even like take that in life like literally like yo you think you're doing a crap job at your you know at your place of employment maybe you know, that one person that like you respect their, their 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 work ethic the most are like, nah, man. Like, I know you haven't been getting like recognized, but like you're doing a dope job. Or like right. even like that one sense you're like, man, I feel like I'm not parenting my kids right, and your kid says that one profound thing that you're just like, man, maybe I am doing something right, kind of situation. Um, you you kind of touched on something there. I know uh, you mentioned in your early submission that you early on there was some instrument you were playing, right? Yeah. Uh, what instrument was that? My memory sucks. Um, so I uh, originally played baritone, uh, the baritone horn, uh, in elementary school for about a year before I uh, quit due to uh, due to bullying. bullying. Yeah. And uh, as somebody that early on got shut down in the music uh, path because of bullying, you've now become a grown man and you're putting out really unique feeling like it's very unique to you and your situation how do you overcome the the people that talk the shit like you mentioned the people that ha are having a bad day so they see your song they're like oh that song sucks they might not even listen to it yeah. or you know how do you deal with those criticisms and still be able to put out that authentic you music um it's funny because uh, a lot of it has to do with like in general like just talking to like like the peers of mine that like I like respect like specifically like I talk to Bela about like this all the time like man like does my music suck and he because like I'm like dude you like play music man so it's like if my shit sucks man like I know you can hear it for sure and he's like always like nah dude it literally doesn't I just think these people are just like you know they don't they either like just don't mess with it because it's different or like they just you know they're just they're just premeditating they're just like they feel bad about themselves or whatever so a lot of it has to do with like venting a lot is like a, a huge thing um because that's one thing like in general like by the way if y'all have mental uh, illnesses i definitely recommend going to therapy it's not for everyone but at least try it a lot of stuff that my therapists over the years have pretty much told me is like or really taught me is how to carp compartmentalize those people into like being like yo they're probably in their own box their own little bubble their own little world and they don't actually mean the things they're saying or like you said they like probably didn't even listen to the thing right. they're just commenting just so they can feel better about themselves because you know they just feel like negativity and shutting people down makes them feel better about themselves so like a lot of it has to do with like just conversations i've had looking back on stuff um you know in general peer reviews like a lot of the times like i'm i send my stuff out to like people that like literally like don't even listen to this type of music i make right. just to get their reaction i've never even heard the kind of music i make or remember my stuff from like when i was used to making stuff in high school to like or making stuff throughout college i was like pretty mediocre to like stuff like now where it's like man i have like an actual full composition kind of going on um and in general like writing mm -hmm. like uh i write a lot of it out uh in kind of like i'll put them all into like one bubble of like this is how I feel because of one situation had that piled on top of another situation and I'll make a song just about the feeling that I had and it'll be like a bunch of different subjects or like why I feel that way like my song Insecure on my Sorry Awkward uh, record like that the first song the first verse is uh, about pretty much someone using you for your time the second verse is about someone using you 
uh, for like gain, like, you know, like, hey man, put me on, but we've never been cool. You only talked to me twice in 12th grade. Like, right. why are you trying to come with me now that you see that? Like, I kind of like have been like doing stuff. Right. Um, and then third verse is generally like more like about yourself being insecure about like myself and being insecure about like the things that like you deal with on a daily basis because like having confidence and getting out of that comfort zone is like a part of life and like not no longer being insecure about the things you were insecure to move on and like progress um but yeah the general like vibe is to like be able to progress and move on does uh live performing help you with all those things that you're kind of talking about of like dealing with those insecurities because i mean some it's amazing to me the more interviews that i do of this with musicians how many musicians either hate to be in front of people or like everything that has to do with performing music seems like the the introvert in you would kind of just shut down what what mm. is it about performing that just makes you just feel alive because i've seen uh, the videos like you yeah. light you light up like a, somebody just flipped the switch when you get to go on yeah. stage. <laughs> um I don't know. I just I, I love performing. I don't know. I, it's it's so weird. It is like a way of like it just feels like I'm just getting everything like off my chest, like right then and there on right. stage. Like even like it's so crazy because I'll literally pick my set list just based on like how I kind of feel or whatever, what I want to do, um, and how I want to make the crowd feel or how I want to perform that day or something like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I love performing. Like literally, it like it's able. So one thing uh, I love about live shows, and like I feel like as a musician, you have to be an active concert goer too, right. because like if you don't understand how people want to re or like receive your like songs live, right. it won't. It'll like I guess diminish the quality your music could have. Like your song could be like two steps from being great, just because you don't have the mentality of like, how would this be perceived live? Right. How would people react to this live? How would they want to chant my like songs and lyrics back to themselves or back to me live? And so like a huge thing is, I want to be able to connect with people in person. So a lot of times I've been getting like, I get a lot of like continuous fans from people who have literally seen me live. Right. Cause they're just like, yeah, the music's cool and everything. And like I like it on record, but man, when I see you live, it's like a completely different song. Right. And it's like and like having that like connection with like your actual fan base that can turn your like fans to friends to people that can know because they'll continually sure. come out and like support you and like they're no longer you know they're no longer casual fans or people are just like yo I know every word to every song I buy merch I got the album I got right. the vinyl I got the stickers the whole thing and got literally, it all. Like, literally like that one personal connection of like how would this be perceived live can like change your music and how people listen to your music in general. Yeah, that was uh, our beginning of, was that beginning of this year or is that last year already? Uh, we went to see a show, Token came to town. Mm -hmm. You know Token? Yeah. Uh, but one of the openers was Ken Archie. Okay. And I, I'd never heard of Ken Archie mm -hmm. before this day, but the way that he controlled a crowd, the way that he made you get in, like he forced you to be entertained mm -hmm. and energetic about what he was doing, kind of teach you a couple words when I say this, you know, you guys say that, like getting that crowd participation mm -hmm. to where you have a good time with somebody at a show like that and then every time that you hear their music afterwards, it takes you back to that personal connection, like you said. Yeah. Kind of like, oh yeah, I remember when he said this or, you know, remember when, you know, you, we, we wanted him to hear that, but he came out with that whole song yeah. that we never even heard of and it was even better than mm -hmm. whatever. Like it's that personal connection that's not just a digital download, I think is yeah. what the difference is in that. Um, but where did we leave off? The next one we got on uh, the project is Jungle Roses? Jade Roses. Jade Roses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got really good handwriting, everybody. <laughs> um, so what's cool about Jade Roses is I was, uh, I guess I was listening to a lot of Flower Boy when I uh, wrote that song, but I was not thinking about Tyler Creator when I made that song, which is the funniest thing about that because every time I perform it or every time someone listens to it, they're just like, Yo, that sounds like it'd be smack on Flower Boy. Like, it literally <laughs> sounds like you're, like, taking notes. Like, listening to the album and taking notes. Which is funny, because... Sort of true, sort of not. Um, around that time when, like, I started, like, composing my songs more of a song structure without being a, uh, verse chorus format, um, I had wrote a bunch of songs in the key of, uh, C-sharp major which is called the Heroes theme, which fun fact is the main key 
that Tyler Crater's Flower Boy is actually in. Um, so I was shout out to Jamil again because he actually showed me this uh, podcast uh, that you can pretty much listen to anywhere that you listen to podcasts um, called Dissect, and it's just uh, how how does he say it? it's a long form musical analysis in short digest digestible chunks. That's the okay. model the motto of the whole thing, and uh, it's like. 30 minute maybe 40 minute like episodes where like he analyzes one song from an entire album so the whole season will be one album and he'll like analyze it song by song have one uh episode for introduction one for outro and within like the seasons that he did he did flower boy and that was the first one i started with because i was like well flower boy is my favorite tyler project and like that's the one I, that pretty much had me like obsessed and being like all right i have to go back I, there's no, there's no way I can't go back and listen to Wolf and Licks of the Bastard. You right. know what I'm saying? Because how did he get to this point from where he was? And I had, you know, and during that uh, podcast, they explain literally the actual like musical like theory behind of what he did. He did a lot of like classical stuff. He did a lot of stuff that was like very jazz oriented. Stuff that like hip hop guys just don't do or you just don't hear on a hip hop record. Period. Right. And one of those main things was he changed the chord structure for a few, quite a few songs in the key of C sharp major, so that they was pretty much a reference back to the previous song that had that key, but he had just reworked the way that the chords actually played out. And so I had originally wanted to make seven EPs about the seven deadly sins. And the first one I was going to talk about was going to be Envy. Um, and Jade Roses was going to be on there. Pokemon Emerald was going to be on there because of the green. And then Leaf Green was also going to be in there. Like there was all like three things that had like the green thing. And they're all in C sharp major. And they're just going to go into each other like super fluidly. Um, so like through literally like just pretty much learning through another podcast. I was able to apply something that someone I have actively listened to on a daily basis into like a song. And I just wanted to have a song where I was like singing a lot more on it. I just wanted to challenge myself to sing a lot more on this project in general. Um, so Jade Roses was like a huge one that came out um, out of just straight envy that of uh, like a pretty much of a relationship uh, that someone was having with uh, another person that like I wish I had but could not have right like you know the rose in my garden is not growing for some reason but for some reason it's super sunny over there and we're right next to each other we're neighbors <laughs> um so yeah and when, when you make a song like that and you put it out what, what's the do you anticipate those people that it's subliminally about hearing it or what's what's that process like for you uh if they know they would they be able to figure it out if they listen to it yeah, the fact that it's happened before, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't I wouldn't uh wouldn't be surprised. Um my song R Lush is actually about someone specific and back when it's about so it's about unrequited love, so it's about a, a, a former um um love interest. Um and when I went actually went back to Maryland to hang out with them for a bit, um, they literally asked me <laughs> if the song was about them, and I was like, "Huh? What, <laughs> what was that again?" <laughs> uh, and eventually, I actually admitted, "Like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's about you." Um, so I've had that happen. Yeah, people come up to me and be like, "Is that about me?" And being like, "After being like, yeah, I'm not gonna sit here and lie to you and say that's not." Um, so yeah, I, I anticipate it happening, even if I don't drop names or anything. Um, but I don't anticipate like reactions of like how, you know, if they'll react negatively or not. Um, mostly just because half the time it's like an expression of like what I'm feeling. Um, it's not. I'm not really like saying anything that would like you know, uh, you know, uh, put them down or anything like that. Gotcha. That makes sense. Uh, let's move on to uh, our next one's what PKMN Emerald, yeah, and uh, that's Pokemon, right? Yep, that is what our acronyms for. Yeah, it. yeah. So the so it's uh, you, you kind of touched on that a little bit before, but kind of give us the the if if we didn't hear that last clip, what can you tell us about that new song? Yeah, so um, Pokemon Emerald or PKMN Emerald or Please Keep My Name Emerald, 
um, is a song about uh, pretty much envy. Um, not necessarily jealousy, because that's one thing I did learn is that jealousy and envy are two different emotions that you feel. Uh, envy is wanting something that someone has that you don't have, and jealousy is the fear of someone taking something that you have away from you. And so I wanted to pretty much make sure that I like hit those points when I made uh, the three pro the three uh, songs. Jade Roses, Pokemon Emerald, and uh, Leaf Green was that I wanted it to be about envy, not jealousy. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted something that I couldn't get. Uh, and please keep my name Emerald it literally just means more or less, you know, just keep my name green. I'm feeling, you know, envy, I'm green for envy type of deal. Um, so it's like still think about me in the sense, I hope you still think about me in the sense that I want you to think about me in. And if you don't, that'll, that'll like shatter me. That's pretty much what that, that kind of like concept is. And like, um, which goes with the hero's theme, uh, C sharp major that Jade Roses, Pokemon Emerald and Leaf Green all are in, um, that I made, that I got after, after uh, Tyler's Flower Boy was that I wanted the heroes because it's normally like the heroes thing comes out when the hero of the story is dealing with something of trial and tribulations either like positive or negative um a lot of the times it comes out when you know it's at that point where the hero of the story has to make a really like crazy decision or like they're testing their actual morals and everything like that and a huge part about how Jade Roses goes into Pokemon Emerald is, you can, if you listen closely, at the end of Jade Roses, I don't finish that uh, the piano phrase. It literally goes womp, womp, womp. And there's no, and it doesn't go back to the C chord, mm -hmm. the C sharp chord. So then when Pokemon Emerald comes in, it immediately hits that same exact chord on beat, which is why they're spaced perfectly like that. So it's like wham, 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 dung. Boo -doo 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 -doo, and it goes into the whole thing and uh when i made that originally the poem at the end the second part um the poem is called nostalgia uh which is pretty much about going to back to a time where like you weren't as stressed about x y and z you know i didn't have to think about you know uh what's making me happy i didn't have to think about am i happy every single day um back when i could literally just flip on my Game Boy, flip on my DS, and just play Pokemon Emerald um, before I had to deal with like us having like, you know, emotional problems with each other, the fact that before I had mental issues, before X, Y, and Z, you know. Um, and through that poem, I was kind of, I wanted to, definitely to put the poem on the record, but I was like, ah, I, don't, I don't think I can like put, justify putting the poem by itself and still have another poem-based song, having two on there would be kind of like diminish it from being like this is a musical record to like this is right. more of a expression of like just emotion or whatever, which is fine. I just didn't want it to be perceived as less of an album. Um, and so I decided, well, I can always have a two-part song. There's always that. I can have two of those. Um, and I ended up going to the studio, making the beat for Pokemon Emerald in like 30 minutes. That's like, crazy. Yeah, when we did, uh, when I sent the uh, drums out to Diggity D, he pretty much didn't change any of the rhythm. Like there, he added like a couple of hits on with, a, or like another, another couple instruments or something like that. But other than that, he didn't really do anything but change the sounds. Um, he pretty much was like, this is perfect the way it is. I don't really want to do anything to this. Um, and right before we were done, with the record right before mastering, I'd uh, hit Jamil up and I said, hey man, if you wouldn't mind throwing some like singing ad-libs on this just throughout the entire like actual song portion right before the spoken word piece, I'd really love that. Uh, Cause it would really bring the, like the whole thing together. And like when he sent it to me, I was like, man, I like literally said, like, I don't even want to chop up your two vocal takes. I'm just going to split them into completely different like panning options and just have it just play like as is because your voice complimented it so well it literally it literally just filled the rest of the song out for right. me and i was kind of like i don't want to take anything out i don't want to chop anything up it's good as is and um it, that's how that pretty much that song came to be
Uh, the more I talk to you, the more it seems like you're just a really avid student of music. Was that self-taught? Was that what you learned at school? Or uh, all the music theory and all the different, uh, th breaking down the ways that it all structurally goes together. Where did that, is that your brain always just work like that? It's so funny because uh, I didn't, I wanted to, I always loved like beat switches and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and key changes in songs a lot. Uh, that was always like one of my favorite things about like, the new brand of hip hop where people like tend to do some more stuff like that, because um, that's a that's a rock thing. That's that's like right. a rock and roll like '70s kind of thing. That's not something that you really hear in popular music these days. So I would say uh, it's like it's more so. It's like it's a little different because I remember some theory from when I first did my I was first you know doing my year of baritone before quitting and stuff and. I had been dabbling and playing piano a little bit. I even took some piano classes in high school and stuff so I could understand theory a little bit more. But I'm like so lazy at the way like classroom settings are like structured. I have to have like either one-on-one -on -one or it's like gotta be like, I'm in the studio, I wanna make the song. What are, what are song keys and chord structures? Right. <laughs> kind of like deal. So like I wanted to learn more about that. Um, I found a couple resources both by myself and through like Tyrell and Jamil who helped me out a lot on that kind of stuff. Um, and I pretty much started teaching myself how to do everything from scratch as like a slow build throughout my entire, entire college career leading up to the release of my project 727 where I did everything by hand. It's not a single sample on there. Um, I played everything by myself. Uh, even though it's like not the only the time that I like made all my beats, but there's like no samples, there's no loops. It's literally just me playing everything out. Um, and so from that, I was like, I like this. I like this feeling of being able to do it all yourself. And then I was like, but I gotta figure out how to take this to the next level. Something's missing. And a conversation I had with a neighbor kid of mine back in Maryland, right before I moved, like literally two days before I moved, he came into my room because he was going to school for the same thing. He was literally getting ready to go to college for the same thing I went to college for. And then he had come to my room, studio area, like listen to some of my beats and stuff. He was like, man, these are really dope, but like the one thing I think you should do, add chords on top. It's like once I think you learn how to add chords on top of your music, it'd be like, it would just, you'd be done pretty much with like these songs. Cause like the only thing that's missing is the fullness of a chord. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he gave me some sources too. He even like sent me some notes from his own theory and stuff because he's like a jazz head, plays multiple like mu like multiple uh, instruments. Literally going to school for music composition and stuff. And like through a bunch of these different resources, I even have like a friend now, Jasper, who's like, "Yo, hit me up if you need to know anything about theory. That's what I went to school for." Uh, and it's a little bit of self-taught, then like like a little taught through like friends and stuff that have given me like resources and things. And it's just like. Putting it all together, it's like I did a lot, a lot, a lot of research, like pretty much on my own. Uh, did I learned like pretty much color theory when it came to music? Um, I wanted to learn more about like why songs feel the way they do, so I learned more about dissonant chords, um, tritones, like crazy, like more advanced like stuff that like hip hop dudes don't learn about, right? Just because it's like more of a musician kind of thing. Um, not uh, it's so weird because it's like saying that it's like kind of funny with hip-hop because like it just doesn't That's the cool thing about it, it doesn't follow the standard it doesn't have to right um, And so like a lot of hip-hop dudes don't use like these classical and jazz based things in their music So when you do hear it, it's like where did this come from? Right. Like, it's a completely different realm of hip-hop that I feel like a lot of people will like haven't touched on yet Yeah, ever since I can remember I've always like searching YouTube for like the the classical slash hip-hop it like the mashups Yeah, like you get some real nice bass and then you get a little bit of Beethoven and You're like mm -hmm. that goes together perfectly. Yeah, and like you said not too many people really either take the time or just go through those type of samples mm -hmm. to put it in Exactly. But good for you for doing that. All right. Our next one takes us to what shadows, right? Yep um so shadows uh, was probably the one, probably the song that took the longest to make, and uh, no shade or nothing, but like basically because Bayla took forever on the guitar <laughs> parts. Uh, it's super funny because we had, so I had everything done um, before the guitar and before the actual live bass. So I wrote a bass line and stuff. 
Um, and I sent the uh, original instrumental to Tyrell and Jamil. And Jamil was like, this is cool. Um, but Tyrell pretty much was saying that, man, I feel like you should have an actual bass, either play the bass line you're playing or just play a completely different bass line. But it needs to be a real bass that fits the song. Because the huge part about Shadows is I wanted it to be kind of like a sad funk song. Mm -hmm. um, that one kind of came. Uh, takes us to Warp Drive. Uh, cool. Like Warp Drive uh, was probably one of the my favorites to produce, honestly. Um, being obsessed with Mac Miller um, during this entire time of this like production was probably one of the top artists I was listening to, next to probably Saba, um, which was like kind of influenced a lot of the way I was rhyming. Um, but I wanted to, like I wanted to make a song. It sounded kind of like Jet Fuel um, from Max Swimming Record. And through that, uh, I kind of just was like, well, let me find the key of the song. The key is like G minor or something like that. And like, I built the chords on top of it, like how I like wanted. Um, and like, I, yeah, I played out like all of like the little like extra melodic stuff, um, the counter melodies and everything. Uh, the one thing that pretty much almost that was one of the ones that like not a lot of like changed the drum like actual pocket itself But a lot of the drum sound stuff changed and like mm -hmm. transitions and stuff uh, Originally I had sent the song to my homies uh, Lexi and Corey of Day Trip we collabed before on uh, set me together on my sorry awkward tape um, and I had pretty much only sent like Lexi sent this like, sent her stuff back to me in like 30 minutes flat <laughs> like it was like really really fast it was, like her stuff was layered already and everything nice like doubles ad libs the whole nine and I was like yo let me get your stems whenever but a huge issue that actually came upon when I was originally making that song before I even got into issues with like the artistry was originally the pre-chorus um had me saying, I don't know, I don't I don't know, over top of it, just like a triple flow, st uh, like a triple flow stutter, kind of like saying, I don't know, because I didn't, literally did not know what I was going to put for the pre, pre, pre chorus, but I knew that I'm like, okay, this is the flow I kind of want. Um, there is a, an artist out in the DMV um, who had, he goes by the name Black Prophet, I don't really care that like his name's out there or whatever, um, but he has a song called Clark Can't, um, and which is crazy is like, I'm actually a, I was, I'm a big fan of his music, uh, and I had put, posted a preview because I was like, man, this song's coming together really good. I want to give a preview of this song out there on like my story, and I had it out there, and I got some messages like, yo, man, what the fuck? This sounds like my song, Clark Kent. This sounds like, and I got messages from other people like, yo, this sounds like Black Prophet's Clark Kent. I'm like, yo, that is not my, that was my, my intent for one. I do that triplet flow um, as a literal warm up for vocals, for rapping, when there it you. comes to like doing flow. Uh, since then, he and I uh, pretty much, like we don't talk as much uh, anymore. I saw him at a, like, a live gig or whatever, but like, we're, I'm pretty much squashed it, so I don't really care about like talking about the story publicly or anything like that. Cause it's something that happened that was a huge misunderstanding and uh, got blown out of proportion. Um, but it's fine, everything's squashed and like things are whatever. Um, even if he's not a fan of me anymore, I'm still a fan of him. Uh, I like right. his music, he makes really quality music. Definitely a dope talent out there. But hey, sometimes this happens in like making music. Sometimes people right. have two ideas that are like, that end up being like the same thing and not coinciding like properly. But For sure. I immediately rewrote like the actual like, I actually wrote the pre-chorus that same like <laughs> night that I got those messages. Um, and yeah, then I sent it back to Lexi. She was like, uh, it'll take some time for me to learn the new ones. And she ended up, we ended up restructuring it in general because Corey ended up not being able to come up with the verse. He was like, man, I just don't feel like I'm coming up with a strong one enough in time. Cause like, man, <laughs> Lexi like murdered it. Like, oh my goodness. <laughs> like when I got her verse back, I was like, yo, did I just get washed on my own song <laughs> in 30 minutes? Like, that bothers me. And so I ended up having to, originally it was gonna be like just the singing part in the beginning and then my first like eight bars was the, was the verse. 
like originally it was like moved over like a whole like almost four eight bars so then like that was my verse mm -hmm. and because of Lexi's verse being so strong I was like man I gotta like just move that to the front write another extra eight at the end um, I moved her from second to third because after Corey dropped out I uh, recruited Bela Lugosi for the second verse um, and originally he was just like I was already planning on moving him to the second verse I just hadn't done it in the like beat uh, originally and he had pretty much like man I'm too in these were saying like I'm too intimidated by this verse to like write this third verse bro and I was like I was planning on moving you anyways but I get it Right. So I changed the structure so it was easier on him to have a mindset of writing. Um, like, okay, I'm the second verse now. Okay, I got, I got what I'm gonna say. Um, and it took him a while to do that, and I literally had to hype, I had to hype him up so hard in the session because he was like nervous. He hadn't recorded in a while, and he was like, "Man, I just feel like my verse ain't, ain't really like that good. It's not polished." I'm like, "Dude, let me read your verse." Read it, and I'm like, "Dude, this is fine. Just wrap it. Just wrap it, bro." And like. From that, I literally had uh, quite a few people, like specifically one of my homies like hit me up, was like, yo, those beginning bars of that second verse, man, that literally stuck with me hard. And like, since then, they was like, really? I was like, dude, I told you you was fine, man. I told you your verse was fine. And <laughs> yeah, so that one was like a real fun one to come out. Um, and specifically the album version having the part two at the end. Um, so. What's cool is I the original track is just in 120. It is literally the radio single like song that I like made. This the, the BPM's 120. It's in a really accessible like key signature, and the single was like three minutes and 30 seconds. And I wanted to actually just like just straight tempo change on them with the same exact structure and then just change the Wurlitzer from like being like more piano to a straight like underwater kind of sound. Um, so I slowed it down from 120 to 104 and we restructured the drums a little bit and I had that one long verse and I've, uh, that's the guy like some of like my favorite bars on the entire thing like some of my favorite wordplay on the whole thing. <laughs> um, it's like all up in that one verse and like I originally was already going to plan to do that because I wanted I wanted to make that was the original part two song that I was going to make, um, because of pretty much Mac Miller having uh, self care being a pretty much part two song with Oblivion at the uh, at the end of it mm -hmm. having that look like cool switch that's still in the same key, um, and so I wanted to do something similar on that. Literally, that's my ode to Mac Miller song from like Dang by Mac Miller. Gotcha. I was listening to that a lot, and I was listening to. Um, a lot of uh, to pimp a butterfly when I like, made that track, and I was like, man, I kind of want to do a weird kind of fusion thing with that kind of like style too. And uh, I had everything done. Um, Bela originally wrote his guitar parts uh, like one night that I had like was helping out a friend doing some crazy like drama stuff going on in their life, and so like. I was, I was like pretty much not in the house at all. I was like, yo, here's the session. I can play this joint on a loop for you. You can practice your joints. I'm gonna go drop this person off, deal with what I'm doing here. I come back, we we'll track. And then like we tracked a demo and then we never went back to the demo until like like almost a year later um, after I'd already gotten the bass line from um, my homie Aaron James from the uh, band Blend, which is a local Columbus band and He's also a, uh, another DJ, like producer that I've worked with. He's actually a fraternity brother of mine, um, but I've worked with him on a couple of, like random singles, and like he sent me some beats, and like we've worked on stuff together. And uh, pretty much, like I had the idea of the one line. Um, I'd rather be was it? I'd rather be left with my thoughts and have you waste your time. I'd rather, yeah, I'd rather, be, I'd rather listen to my thoughts and have you waste your time. That one line that I, it was, I literally sent it to somebody in a text through and it was a huge thing. I don't want to go into, it was like a huge like drama thing, but like I sent that to that person in that text and that one line was like, man, that line literally like that, 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 that sentence literally made me feel some type of way to the point where like, yeah, I got to write a whole song about it. So like, uh, the concept of, Thinking you should be with the person that you think is going to make you right, but ultimately realizing that they're not right for you, right. um, is where that kind of like that came from. Um, 
And uh, I guess the title Shadows came from Childish Gambino Shadows because like I also was like thinking about that song a lot when I like wrote that, um, which is why the song is just like layered the way it is. Honestly, with all like with the singing passages over singing patches, passages over top of the rapping passages, over top of like the um, you know monotone uh, melodic passages. Then I have like the heavy auto tune singing. Then I have like the not auto, heavy auto tune singing. Um, and then I have a spoken word piece at the end over top of the chorus. And it's like, it's like the way I like structured it together was like, I wanted to make a ballad. Cause there are no hip hop ballads. That's not a thing. So I was like, I want to do that. No one, no one does this. Ballads aren't really like a thing that you hear in music too often. R&B doesn't do that much anymore. The times you hear ballads are probably like more indie bands and kind of mm -hmm. thing. So I was like, I want to see if I can bring this kind of like style to like hip hop and like try and like do it in my own kind of way. Um, but yeah, that was during like a pretty emotional time of mine, which is a uh, really cool how like Jade Rose's Pokemon Emerald and Shadows all go into each other the way they do, even though Shadows is not even in the same key. I think it's actually in like D minor or something like that. Gotcha. Would you have made the same project without Mac Miller? It sounds like he was quite the, quite the influence. Um, what's funny is I think the project was still sound similar to how it did um but i think with i think mac miller's death is what really spun me to be like i need to study these people while they're alive right like i need to study these people while they're making the music because mac dropped circles and i was like what is even this album now? And apparently it's supposed to be a triptych. There was supposed to be a third one on the end too. It was supposed to be Swimming in Circles with another project on the end, which we'll unfortunately never hear. But it's like the fact that this dude's like, he was already on to something else like years and years and years before Swimming even came out. Right. And like, I was like, man, I gotta like listen to, like I learn from these people now while like I can. And so like, it made me go back and like study how like he did certain things and like, you know, learn, like watch some interviews and stuff and like learn like, okay, so that's what, that was his mindset when he like makes music like here, like, okay, that's what he was thinking when he wrote that song kind of deal. Um, I think if Mac Miller had not unfortunately died, it would be, it would sound probably closer to a Tyler heavier influence, I think. Tyler like Childish Gambino, mm -hmm. um, mostly just because of this mind state I was already in when like I was going to make this make the album anyways I had like right a huge like I want to go for my because the internet again like because I like wanted to try and do it before but I feel like I messed up doing it and I want to do it again now but I can learn different things from other artists and like fly I've been listening to flower boy a lot I was like ah, I like the way he does it with like the whole concept is he's literally just in his car driving to somebody's house the whole time and like he just drops the car off and just starts walking on foot literally just like, the sound effects in between mm -hmm. like certain songs and stuff I was like man i gotta learn how to do things like that um so like i think it was just like it would be slightly different but i think because of mac miller's untimely death it like jumped jumped his influence into uh my music more than it already had gotcha well, if you could pick one Mac Miller project and you could only listen to that one project and none of his other discography, what are you listening to? Mm. <sighs> that face there is how you know you asked the right question. Yeah, oh man. <sighs> I want to say watching movies but only if it's the bonus track. If I'm not allowed to have the bonus version, then it has to be Good AM. I think that's what it is. I think that's fair. I, I was in my head. I was going uh, movies or trying to decide something of like the very early years. Yeah, because like for me, or actually to make this even mm -hmm. harder, did you include? Um, uh, what can I come up with it? The, the demonic shit that he made. Um, oh, the uh, uh, Larry Fisherman stuff. The, uh, the, the Delusional Thomas. Delusional, Delusional Thomas. Thomas. Yeah, Larry Fisherman was, was a jazz, jazz project. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which I think that was another brilliant thing that he did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To where instead of putting all that out under the Mac Miller label, mm -hmm. to, to just come out with a whole different persona. So if it doesn't hit, yeah, it was just a throwaway project. But yeah. if it hits, then you're like, yeah, that was a that was the like Faces was fantastic. That was a huge. Uh, the personification of like different artists was a huge like influence on me because I wanted to do that. I, I still do 
that's which is why I'm so invested in like a different genre of us mm -hmm. uh, and different music projects under different genres and different labels and different complete sounds or whatever um, is because like the whole having a persona in music is so rare these days that when you have someone like Mac Miller who, is do, who does Larry Love Steen and then Larry Fisherman and Delusional Thomas like when you find those like projects it's just like yo where when did he make this because like <laughs> literally the Larry Lovestein stuff start only started showing up to me once I started listening to circles like religiously right and then out of nowhere I was just like Larry look this is this is Mac hold right. on and then I had to do more research and I was like oh man that's really I really like how he did that um because I feel like a lot of uh you gotta like dig for certain artists that do that kind of right. stuff. It's like really heavy, like independent guys or like underground dudes that do that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, uh, for me, uh, Best Day Ever was a huge, huge, huge influence on like what made me Mac Miller, like a Mac Miller fan. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what's funny is, I mean, that project has aged iffy. Um, Specifically, the Donald Trump song, <laughs> which he is, I love that interview where he literally denounced, like, his actual, like, like yeah, I don't support that dude anymore. Uh, this song is just a song. All right. <laughs> uh, FDT. Uh, but, but, yeah, uh, uh, the fact that uh, he had, like, that progression, to from, like, right. just the happy kid to the more emotional stuff was, like, a huge, huge play on, like, how I made music, too. That makes sense. I see that for sure. Our next one we got is uh, Han Solo. You released that as a single before the regular yeah. project, didn't you? Yep. Um, almost, ah, wow, whole year before actually. Um, in 2019, uh, I said earlier in the uh, interview that I had a gig. Uh, I played my first festival in uh, 2019. It was a local festival in Columbus called Narbecue. Um, and I got booked from this guy, uh, Zach, who plays bass in the band Taurus Trap out there. Um, Zach is also a DMV native. Um, I think he's originally from like either Anne Arundel County or Baltimore, and he moved out there and stuff. And uh, so he had worked at the bar across the street from where I would frequent and play open mics, and he just... He has friends that play over that played over there and stuff. Um, the DJ guy that was the host was a huge friend, a uh, big friend of him, and so like he came in one day, saw me playing, like, and immediately was like, "Yo, you're from Maryland?" And I'm <laughs> like, "Yeah, I'm from the DMV up Maryland." And he's like, "Yo, me too." Blah blah. And we started hitting off and stuff. Blah, blah, blah. And he had pretty much said like, eventually he had seen me enough times where it's just like, "Man, I know I just like booked all these acts and stuff." For like my festival that I put on every year, but like man, it'd be really dope if I could get you on doing like a quick like 15-20 minute set like right before like the like closer of the night, OG Vern. And I was like, well, yeah, man, that'd be that'd be dope. He's like, man, I can pay you and stuff too. I mean, originally I wasn't supposed to get paid or whatever, um, but he pretty much was like, yo, I'm not gonna go back on my word or whatever. I'll still pay you and things. And but I was like, I'll still do. It. I was like, I'll still do it for free if that's like what it's about because this is supposed to be for charity. But regardless, I got like a, like cool little like gig under right. my belt. Like for to sure. get, be one of the only like acts also getting paid out there too was pretty cool. Um, and like got to network. And, like I played uh, with uh, I played before Happy Tooth and Doug, which is like uh, their full band kind of dig. Uh, and then, like, in between them and, like, OG Vern, was, like, pretty dope, like, 15, 20 minutes set, and, like, uh, I released Han Solo originally because I was going to drop YK2 in 2019, but I decided to touch it up and everything as I started, like, making more songs. I was like, I wanted this to come out right. Um, so Han Solo was, like, something that was fun for the crowd that I could, like, make for literally for that specific like festival something new would be like yo this is a single for the summer this joint's hot run it up and like i would literally be like yo i need some crocker participation every time i say shoot first i need y'all to say go hard so i'd be like shoot first go hard damn right. think i go hard kind of and so like that was like one thing that like maybe be like i gotta start thinking about how i'm gonna perform songs live i can't just like make a song and then like perform it live because if like it doesn't come off as like a really good song to play live no one's gonna care that i'm playing live or what energy i have on the stage or right. whatever so that was like one thing that hugely influenced like hansel and the early release of it as well because like 
people really like that song and it had really good traction when i first had uh dropped it and like even like that whole year span that it like came out a lot of people were just like man that uh shoot first song man is always stuck in my head <laughs> i'm just like awesome i'm glad uh, people like that so. Abs absolutely uh we're c coming on to the back end of it uh the next one we have is runaway x broken right yeah uh, far away far, yeah, far, far away. away x broken yeah um so I tell you, I should be a doctor the way I fucking <laughs> scribbled out this shit. Like, I've been listening to this for like the last four days, and I'm like, that looks like an R. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally understand, though. Because uh, sometimes I'll be like just trying to write something down. I'm like, what? I mean, we write things so seldomly anymore. It's all type. But yeah. I was like, you know, I'm using everything I normally type on to make sure that we get this out. Exactly. But uh, what can you tell us about that song? Um, so what's cool is I literally just got to explain this um, a couple of days ago because... Uh, my homie Bela literally pointed this out to me because he like he literally paused the song and was like, yo man, I heard that piano sample in the beginning, bro. I know where that's from. Like no one else out here unless they knew my discography was gonna know where that's from. And that's uh a series of songs that I used to literally just rap over that one piano sample in the beginning. It would just be on a loop for like four minutes straight and I just like freestyle over top. It would be like a venting session for me. Mm -hmm. And I had, as you can, as like the song indicates, that's the 10th iteration of it. And it's also the first time, well actually the second time I ever wrote to it. Um, I mean, it's normally a freestyle thing. I tried writing to the piano um, many a times, but it like never came out the way I wanted to. It wasn't raw like I wanted to. Um, and so I would just freestyle over top of it. I would always get the way I wanted to, to sound. And then I'd sing with like super heavy autotune on the end, like just far away and just some like riffing stuff. Mm -hmm. And so when uh, I made that song, that song was originally like seven minutes long. <laughs> and I had really personal stuff on the front half, which was probably closer to about like five minutes in the back half, which is like two, three-ish minutes. And uh, I just couldn't say some stuff on it, and the song was just a little too long, and I was just stretching like the actual like limit I wanted to have on the album because people's you know attention spans are like not as long and not as good these days. So like if you have um, a project that's over an hour long, people are gonna consider that a long project. Right. So I wanted to cut it down to about 44, 45 minutes, so that like people could listen to it it'd be a really good nice like you know digestible listen not too long not too short and then maybe even at the end you're just like man i want to listen to that again you right. know having that like emptiness at the end where it's like man i feel like i didn't digest the whole thing i gotta go back right and like make sure i replay this it was like a part of the thing and far away x was a huge huge like factor in that like was i going to keep the whole like seven minute track was i going to like chop it up in a specific way and so what I did is for like my uh, auto-tuned vocals, I actually learned how Kanye West did that, his effect on Runaway, um, which is what I did uh, in the beginning. So you have the regular piano playing and then as soon as the first phrase is over, it starts playing in reverse. And so it's the pretty much the end of Far Away x and then it just goes into like uh like the singing part and then comes into like a drum part so like that like harmony thing that's kind of sound like like guitar is playing is like really just me singing in reverse with like that fuzz effect on that kanye has on runaway and so i uh wrote the poem broken at a completely different at a completely separate time because i i don't know i was just on something one one day and i was just like i really like enjoyed that poem and i was like man i gotta put this on the record i really feel like this belongs on the record and i made a whole different like piano section a whole I produced a whole like new bass line all that kind of stuff for that and then when i had it all together i was like man it's a little too long and i just edited it shortened it up had to like do like that movement or whatever um and, like what's the cool thing is about like the faraway x thing is that that was the first time i actually put drums on the beat too so there's like a whole like different version of that song that like will pretty much that's a personal thing for me nice you know like pretty much no one else will ever hear it unless like you're with me personally in my room and you're sitting down and you're gonna listen to it with me and it's still gonna have the bleeped out parts because i don't i'm the only one that needs to know those parts <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome uh we've got uh we've already touched on this one a few times before but 
um, just a fresh take on the uh, leafy green. Yeah, on uh, so leaf green is uh, so the way it's spelled is like super funny because I am really into um abnormal song titles or <laughs> naming your song not necessarily the chorus or whatever um and uh leaf green ends up not being that case because i end up yelling that for almost a minute straight at the end but the case of that being leaf green as in like pokemon leaf green which is why the beat is so fun um and kind of like video game edm -y. Mm. um and I make a couple Pokemon references in, in it as well. Um, but also, leave green, leave envious. Um, so, you, I may have been envious towards you this whole time and like wanting you around here in my life or like, you know, I want that thing that like I see that you have that I don't. But at the end of the day, I'm learning, I'm realizing that I'm better off doing my own thing and you're the one that's actually envious and you're trying to lead me on to want what you have because you're insecure about what you want and it's okay that we're all broken but at the same time like because i realized my worth before you realize my worth to you that i was able to leave the situation and now you're looking at me like damn why couldn't I have done that? Why couldn't I be like that? Now, like I'm not winning. Mm -hmm. You're, I'm, I'm, I'm envious of your, of you winning. So it's like we're going. We may have like been through a lot together, but if you're not about, you know, us progressing as a as a team, then you're just going to be the one leaving the relationship envious, not me. Gotcha. Yeah, and so like uh, that was like a huge like. Thing about that and i just wanted to make it really fun to like a fun sad song kind of like and i have like some like meme references in there too like be gone thought um like the whole the uh, uh, a dr fate thing where you see where like you know it's like if she breathes she's a thought kind of like like right. meme like thing or whatever and like i have like a couple like humorous kind of things in there too so it's like not as sad dark as you know it right. is like kind of like a like tongue-in-cheek about it yeah, it's, it's funny that you say that and you also get get along with Jamil so well. Like, when I was first doing... Because whenever I get somebody on the podcast, you know, I try to go through the music as much as possible. And, like, his stuff, if you just listen to it at the top value, you're like, oh, this sounds good. This is light. This is pop. This is this is good. And then you start getting into it, you're like, that was really sad shit that he was just yeah. talking about. <laughs> but, like, the, the ability of an artist like yourself or Jamil to kind of release that sadness but then put a positive spin mm -hmm. on it to where you could take it both ways if you're just looking for something to nod your head to it's there or yeah. if you're actually looking for something deep it's there it's yeah it's it's not not something i don't think many people could do as far as songwriting for sure mm -hmm. which is uh funny because leaf rain being so bought so far down in the album's track list actually influenced how i like did some stuff for uh dancing depression in the beginning with it being like light but also like about like right. some like negative like more darker stuff right yeah you, you did a good job on that well done thank you thank you uh we got uh, two more yk2 the the, the title, title track. track yeah um so yeah i just wanted to rap yeah that one i just kind of wanted to flex on my rapping skills because like i took the entire album to really hone and like focus on like music and right. like having a concept of a song and like doing something a specific way or like having like wanting to try and experiment like a really odd and peculiar way that i hadn't done before or try something new that was just kind of wanted to rap i just yeah that's, that's, kinda, a, that's yeah. a fair explanation just really wanted to rap one in um and and i wanted to get my young kings on it, and they originally were already going to be on that and that was going to be originally to be the song that they were only on um outside of their uh additional vocal features when they sang some background stuff for me um and the reason why they have uh reason why tyro's features on another one is because another guy dropped out and that kind of stuff right so it's like uh this is like the original young king's track i wanted on here too um and like yeah they came with their thing um it didn't take them long to like hit me back like that one was like pretty straightforward the one thing i did have trouble with was the beat on the back end, I was having really is really bad issues with like my drum samples and like getting it to sound in the pocket that I wanted. And as soon as I sent it to Diggity, 
he knew exactly what I was hearing and then just it was able to like fit it in like exactly how I wanted to with like different sounds and different instruments and nice. like a talking drum is in there or something crazy like that <laughs> like you know um so yeah is, is that uh how would you describe that feeling of being able to like fully tap into somebody's musical brain it, it seems like you found quite a few kind of lifelong yeah. connections that your brains kind of just go on that same the same wavelength um it's a crazy feeling, actually, um, especially like with Bela, because I've been making music with Bela for like years. I've known him for over 10 years now. Uh -huh. And like a huge reason why we're friends is through like music. And uh, the fact that I can literally like sit with him and sing a vocal line and be like, I want you to make a song that kind of sounds like this, or I'll sing a chorus like um, our song Tumblr Crushes that we have together, the first joint on um, Sorry Awkward. I literally sang the original, like the chorus that's on there is not the original chorus. I sang the original chorus to, for him, and he just literally found the chords were in which, you know, the key I was like singing. I was like, okay, so you want me to do this? And it was like in, I think it was in B flat minor or something like which was the exact key I wanted it to be in. Like, it, was, it was some crazy stuff like that where like, it, it's a really crazy feeling because I've like collabed with quite a few people, but like the people I constantly go back to are the ones that I'm like, hey, I have this idea, what do you think? And they can like easily play something out or they're just like, oh, I already hear what you're going for. And even as I explain more, they're just like, I got it. And then they're able to like pull it all together. I'm just like, that's pretty much perfect. Like Bela playing guitar in certain sections like matches like my flow, even though he wrote the guitar part completely separate to me writing my verse. Right. And just having to work that kind of way. That's so. awesome. Our last one was uh, the last one. You told us that's the last one that you wrote. Yeah. But what can you tell us uh, in addition to about Sarah Landing? So um, when I wrote that, uh, I was right before um, it was right before the showcase. I had produced the majority of that beat for somebody else, and then we ended up having a falling out. Um, that dude also used to live in my house, and then he moved out, and so it was like crazy. Uh, <laughs> And uh, eventually, because uh, I pretty much was like, well, this guy's not hitting me back. I guess I just have this beat for myself now. And I reworked it, restructured it for me um, in general. And because uh, I was listening a lot to Beautiful at the time, too. And the fact that Jamil had that beautiful reprise at the end, I was like, man. I need like a song kind of like that, not necessarily a, like a reprise because I started it off with Summer Snow, but like a concluding like kind of like outro right. kind of like song that some, not necessarily sums up everything, but like it, everything comes to a head and then like this is like what I leave you out with something nice and like lush, like not necessarily quote unquote easy to listen to, but like I also never wrote a song about my story or whatever. So mm -hmm. that song is generally like about a quick story about the come up and like why I started making music, how I started making music and everything. Um, I shout out some of my former projects on there. I shout out like my friends like Hunter and like Bale on there about like instrumentalists that I met in high school. Like I kind of just wanted to do kind of like a little my own like beautiful reprise right. kind of thing. Um, and I named it Sarah Landing after the street that um, I grew up on uh, from like I guess like most of elementary to high school. Nice. Yeah, I lived in one other place prior before like second grade. But yeah. Awesome. And that concludes YK2. Yeah. I don't think we touched on this, but I wanted to say that one of the persons that we didn't use questions, and it's also a question I typically ask, how do you know when a song is finished and ready to be released? Because I know that you've reworked a bunch, mm -hmm. and I know you go back and forth. Is it just something with feedback, or is it internal? What's it's ready it's ready to go a lot of the time uh if i have an idea for a song or like i'll go into like making a song with like i guess a goal in mind i try to at least so if it's like use as little chords as possible like with right. maybe doubt or with um a lucy single that i had called dirty where like i literally like used two to three notes slash chords to like structure an entire song or if it's like something like I want to make a ballad like shadows that took the longest time to make um because I would hear I would literally hear 
certain um, aspects of a song like man it would sound cool if something else was in here I don't know what it's missing but it almost sounds like there's an L there's a space I can still fit something in and if there's still space I can fit something in it feels like the song is not quite finished so it's like you can have a super simple song like maybe doubt or dirty even Han Solo is pretty simple with the way I like have it actually structured when you like put it like actually laid out it's just the matter of is there space left in this song for me to add something else without it taking away from the actual sonic integrity of the song gotcha so for me a lot of the time it's listening to it over and over and over again or sending it out to people i send it out to like multiple people people that don't really like like my vibe people that are new to the vibe people i've worked with for forever like Jamil and Tyrell probably heard the majority of this album while it's in its early stages and then once it started really getting tweaked they never heard anything from it ever again <laughs> until it finally got released right you know so it's like stuff like that where like I'll literally send it to like other people like sometimes I'll literally I sent the whole project to random people that I'm like yo I don't know if you'll like this All right listen to it and tell me how like you feel those are some of my favorite messages that i get like the unsolicited like just looking for feedback opposed to like i'm trying to get a million views look check my shit out yeah but, like i'd like to not listen to the same shit all the time mm -hmm. like a lot of people aren't like that they get in that one lane yeah. like i like like you were saying earlier i like down south hip-hop and that's it or whatever but mm -hmm. Um, a crazy girl I met like 15 years ago nothing good have ever came from this except one quote of there's no such thing as bad music just mm -hmm. music that's not for you not right now yep. which when you break that down you're like that's exactly stuff I did in like 10 years ago you go through some more life experiences you're like oh I like that now or yep. you hear different things or you learn even um, some artists I've had on I, I haven't been a huge fan of their music until then you sit down and you talk with them for an hour and you kind of see the process and you see all that goes into mm -hmm. it and then you listen to it again and you're like oh I like that now because I like yeah. the story behind it opposed to just like the sonic value or mm -hmm. the lyrical value or something yeah that's like that's one thing I feel about <laughs> Lil Uzi Vert so much because <laughs> I love his personality and like how he like presents himself like 100% like I would love to hang out with that dude but I feel like that's why I don't really vibe with the music like that because like I don't know him personally. Right. So like I can't really see like what he's necessarily going for with like his really unique style of like auto crooner like cloud rap kind of thing. Right. Um, let, let's get a couple quick uh, just knee jerk reactions on things. Yeah. Um, being that you've been in Columbus for a while, three things everybody needs to do while in Columbus. Okay. Um, we'll figure somebody between the ages of twenty and forty. Yeah, okay, so, uh, gotta hit up Dirty Frank's, uh, best hot dogs in town. Okay. Um, uh, you gotta, honestly, like, people don't realize this about Columbus, but, like, our natural, like, parks and stuff, our metro parks, and even, like, some of our non-metro, just natural parks are, right. like, some of the dopest, like, ever. Like, they have, like, some of, like, the coolest, like, little, you know, things you can do, like, in the cut. And it's just like you'll just go to one like little like corner of it and like most beautiful thing you've ever seen like for no reason like it's just like hidden back there i haven't done much in columbus park wise but dublin which is close to columbus yeah right? dublin's got that's, some really cool uh, waterfalls and everything like that down yeah, there yeah yeah. that's actually where i uh, work nice. my day job uh indian park or indian run oh or, yeah yeah indian run road or whatever yeah that was a really cool park mm -hmm. down there for sure yeah uh, so we got we got to eat hot dogs at dirty franks we got to go check out some parks and what's our third um Honestly, that sounds like a good day. What are we doing at nighttime? Checking out that local music scene. Honestly, the local music or comedy scene, like the live scene out there in Columbus is actually really, really crazy, really unique. You'll find some crazy, like you have like a uh, woman fronted punk bands, all girl punk bands, uh, crazy, like only like LGBTQ like uh, groups, like you have like burlesque mixed in with like a bunch of different like Things like, you know, like hoopers, fires, twirlers, all that kind of stuff. Live scene out in Columbus is crazy. You'll find something really random in some, like, dive bar that, like, you might find your next favorite artist there or something like right. that. It's pretty much how I found Happy Tooth, you know. I was just at some right. random bar playing an open mic, and I'm just like, 
this dude is dope. Like, I want to make music with this guy here. And same nice. thing with like some other dudes. Like, Willie Clark is a really dope dude that I met out there through those kind of things. Like, dude makes crazy, like, hybrid music, too. Like, so checking out the live scene for sure. And uh, we'll, we'll piggyback off that. Three people that uh, make music that more people should know about. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, Willie Clark, for sure. Uh, I'm going to just go ahead and say Happy Tooth and Doug as a like whole. Because like, when they're together as Happy Tooth and Doug, they have a full live like, hip-hop, rock, slash, fusion, alternative, indie thing, band going on. And then when they're Doug and Happy Tooth, they're a rap duo nice. that make like stuff over beats. And, you know, like, actual production and stuff like that. And they have their own like little side gigs and side projects and solo stuff too. So like that band as a whole like has a lot of stuff going on, which is really dope. And then uh, Cali Dreamer. It's a dude I have yet to collaborate with, but a dude I've seen live. Uh, I saw him open for Happy Tooth and Doug. I got to meet him in person. I've been chatting with him on IG and stuff. And like, man, I, I plan to make music with this dude eventually. Um, this dude's really dope. He like makes really similar stuff to me, like uh, like in the more like punk side of it. Like he plays guitar. Um, he raps, he sings, he like does like the whole fusion thing, like he talks about anime, like he raps about like JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, like <laughs> crazy stuff like that. Like dude's really dope. All right. Uh, let's go with uh, one or two things that people would not think about uh, the full experience of having dreadlocks. Okay, uh, one, they're not dirty. Whoever tells you they're dirty is a fucking liar and doesn't know what they're talking about. <laughs> they're actually the most high maintenance, like, hairstyle you could probably get as, like, a black person in general. It's just, like, you're dealing with so much. You, like, even though you don't, you're not supposed to wash your hair, but, like, once to twice a month because it, that's what strengthens your hair. You're not really supposed to wash your hair, but, like, once every two weeks anyways right because like if you keep doing that like washing your hair every day it thins out which is a huge thing that like people it's a huge misconception about hair in general but yeah dreadlocks are not dirty you literally cannot lock your hair if your dreadlocks are dirty period it just won't work it'll get really gunky your hair will fall out it will thin out it'll look disgusting you will never be able to grow your hair again <laughs> um second thing uh that's a misconception is uh they're not, they're not that fun. <laughs> they're not that fun to have. They're like basically because of like the, oh, the maintenance. maintenance. Yeah, they're like everywhere. They're heavy. I was gonna ask. Oh that. man, they're so. I mean, heavy. Yours goes what mid back? Yeah, mine goes almost like to my butt now. But yeah, it's all it's, it's especially getting, once it gets wet. I could only imagine mm -hmm. it's just yank your neck back, right? Oh yeah, it's like literally just stuck like this, and like you just feel like you have five pounds on your neck. And you're like, oh. You gotta wring it out when you dry it too. It's like a whole. It's a whole process. Right. Yeah. So like, yeah, they're heavy as hell. They are not fun to have. How long have you been growing them? Um, I've been growing mine for about it's 2020, about seven, eight years. So we know they're high maintenance. They're not fun. They're heavy. I'm sure they're hot. So what makes it something that you keep and something? Is it just? Is that just become you? Yeah, pretty much. It's so crazy. Like uh, as a uh, specifically as a black person who has uh, locks. Um, it's like kind of like become like a spiritual kind of like religious kind of thing. Gotcha. Like you, you got you know specific locks like look away. You even name some of them. Some have personality and stuff. And so like even after a while, like, it's like when you ha when you make it through the ugly stages of having locks, then like this is like a solid year where they're just going ugly. They just look <laughs> terrible. If you get through that year, that whole year, to the point where, like, you know, they're about shoulder length, they look really good, you know, every time you get them done, you can do stuff to them, like, you'll just fall in love with them with no matter how, like, you know, I, how much of a I, pain it is to, like, take care of them. I, I feel everything you just said there, there's a big similarity to beards. Mm -hmm. I, I think the biggest I've gone is about nipple length. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, that's still, like, a foot of shit coming off yeah. your face. But it's that same thing. Like you got to get past a little bit past here. It's going to get itchy, and then it's going to get a little bit curly. But as long as you could kind of maintain it, and once it comes down, it's like you said. It's kind of just like almost a spiritual. Like this is me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you didn't have dreadlocks, where would you go? Would you, would you go ball, full, full on shave? Would you go fade? Uh, I'd probably go with uh, either a high top fade, or I like I'd either. So yeah, I'd either have go with the high top fade. Maybe full afro or like go between like braids and like twists and like afro. Like kind of like 
what Smino does, like he goes between the braids, he wears it out, mm -hmm. and then he has like twists sometimes. That was like what I was kind of doing originally. So if I didn't have locks, I'd probably probably go back to doing that if I just didn't just do the high top fade. Gotcha. Now, to me, like once I realized how far back this was going, and you know, I was like, oh well, you know, I could kind of grow it and kind of just. It's like no. Yeah. Like you got to learn. I'm sure, like you said, I washed my hair way too much. I wore hats and then. You know, plus hereditary and everything yeah. else. You're like, oh, I'm just gonna admit defeat. I'm mm. not gonna be trying to do some comb over shit yeah. into my forties <laughs> and everything. But just, just get rid of it. Um, you said your favorite food is sushi. If there is one food that you could eat for the, but you could only eat this food, what are you eating? Is it sushi? Probably yeah, yeah. Because like the whole the cool thing about sushi in general, seafood is. Um, you can just kind of eat it forever. Um, then, like being from Maryland, a uh, coastal state, East Coast, like uh, has to has to be some type of seafood in my life. Crab period. cake, yeah, heavy, heavy <laughs> crab cakes. Uh, blue crabs, crab legs, um, lobster tail, like shrimp. We used to be like big one, like as a kid, right? Like um, even like uh, calamari and like mussels and stuff. Now so I was like, yeah, right. so I had to have some seafood in my life. Uh, if there's one thing as a musician that you know now that you could go back 10 years ago and implement, what would it be? Uh, so back when I was 14. Uh, mm, you could change the time frame if you want, but if you, if you could take one piece of knowledge and go back with it, what would it be? Would be pretty, honestly, it would be how I, how I learned, how I know theory is like, would pretty much be like, yo, pay attention to uh, your, your theory mm -hmm. uh, coaching and stuff. Uh, pay attention to the piano class because like you're going to use a lot of that stuff later on. I don't care how lazy you feel. I feel the same thing. Same thing about math. Yeah. I, I used to think I would never need math and you know like just the project I'm doing in there I, I'm doing adding, subtracting, measuring, trying to figure oh, out yeah. all this shit all day and you're like I should have really paid attention. Yeah, that's or you know, like I do landscaping during the day, mm -hmm. marketing during the night. So like I just went in I'm tr in my head. I'm like, all right, so it's a shape like this. If it's seven foot here and eleven foot there, you're like, average is eight. Mm -hmm. Call it nine, just so we got some extra material. Mm -hmm. But like in school, you're like, I'll never need to know yeah. Pythagorean <laughs> theorem. Now you're like, oh, I should have paid attention to that. Yeah, but <laughs> that was a huge uh, deal with like when building the stage for the showcase too. Was like. Gotta get it's, your angles. And yeah, it's it's because it's like weirdly fit because our uh, house has a weird. Uh, it's everything's at half inches for some reason in my house. I like <laughs> all the angles and stuff. The walls right. are half inches, and it just makes no sense. Yeah, so like, like we had to like attenuate for like weird like length numbers and stuff. It was like ridiculous. Yeah, this is this house was made in 1917. Mm -hmm. So we got 103 years of things shifting like. We're putting in the floor, you can't cut the board straight because the wall's not straight. Yeah. Or doing those panels in there, like I can't just make all seven inch, you know, planks for the one section because this one's seven, this one's seven and a quarter, this one's six point four. Yeah. You're like, oh fuck. <laughs> exactly, that's the whole deal with like our uh, thing too, because we have our house goes like there's a little sink in the middle, right? And so like uh, especially where like the stage is, like the edges are almost completely off by like a quarter of an inch on all three sides. <laughs> so like when you actually have like the two by four on it, you have to pretty much attenuate for almost two inches extra room. That's awesome. Which is like <laughs> one thing that we like figured out once we like built the frame and had it in and then we were going like, all right, so what if we put the actual board on top and then we realized, oh, we have to shave off some stuff because these two by fours literally like take off some some of the actual original measurements that we had right. because the house is built so weird because <laughs> they were just like we can build houses let's just build a house right yeah that's these people that had this one too i feel the same way um what is the hardest thing of marketing yourself as a musician uh i would say it's literally knowing how to market your own self because mm -hmm. it's really easy to look at someone else and be able to tell like where their best qualities are come from and how to like promote something for them like specifically like with like Jamil the thing I would like promote the most with Jamil is how unique 
how uniquely he makes his like production mm -hmm. and like i would like be like man you should do some twitch streams of you literally making a beat you literally going i'm through, so like, glad you said that did you listen to his interview that i did with him yeah I, i've always had like that thought process of like man jamil should just do something live with like his he, production he should have a full-on podcast and he, same with kind of especially now that you've explained your process being that it's kind of similar to have a podcast version not just to stream song but to have just pretty much what we just did here mm -hmm. with each song to have instead of just putting out that 14 track thing have a two hour thing of this is explaining the behind the scenes this is the video of how it all came together at the end you have your three minute song yeah you put out each one of those as a podcast and if you do it through anchor you're, you're spotify as a musician you're making point zero 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 four cents per stream mm -hmm. where every time somebody listens to a podcast i make a, a penny or, yeah. yeah a penny so you're already what was that eight to 8,000 times more mm -hmm. profitable, but then it also creates that whole, the same thing of having that live experience of, oh, I watched beginning to end and saw how this all came together. Yeah. Or you play the song at the beginning and then show how it could mm -hmm. de deconstruct it. Yeah. There's so many things that you could do that way, which then makes so much more content. Because a lot of people have issues of how do you make content yeah. to keep going on. But just doing this, I'm gonna have like, You'll be there every Tuesday for six fucking months mm -hmm. if, I, if I take the time to clip it all out. And a lot of people just leave that on the table. They're like, no, here's the song. Go, yeah. go to iTunes and stream it. Yeah, that was like a huge thing I was doing in promotion for the album was I started doing um, like strip down versions and like breakdowns of like my singles right right before my computer crashed i was gonna like continue to do a little bit like more of a series we're gonna go into han solo and then from there i was gonna go back up top post release and do some stuff so i'm still probably gonna do some stuff right. with like that whole strip down series or whatever but that was something i was literally starting to implement for promotion of the album so then i could have a bunch of content going throughout the whole process as well yeah i would definitely look into definitely do that but take the audio version and throw it on to some sort of podcast yeah. platform because again the whole idea of any marketing is to tell your own story but to put it into any medium that people are looking mm -hmm. at so have the video have the audio have the podcast even do a written, you know, documentary mm -hmm. of this is all the lyrics and how I came to them. So yeah. that way, no matter how people like to take in your story, you're telling a unique story. Mm -hmm. Here's, how do you like it? Here. How, yeah. Oh, you like it this way? Here you go. Yep. Soapbox, you get a one minute. You can go promotional. You can go inspirational. Just let them know how to find you. But you get one minute to end the interview however you want to go. And it starts whenever you start. All right, cool. Um... Yo, B dot Jeff here. Uh, first off, you can follow me everywhere at B D O T J E F F three zero one. That's B dot Jeff three zero one on all social media platforms. Uh, stream YK two everywhere. Um, I was doing proceeds all July on my Bandcamp to BLM charities, but what I'm doing now is every cent I make through this album, period, on Bandcamp is going to BLM charities. So copy album there if you want to support Black Lives Matter. Um, Black Lives Matter also, you know what I'm saying? Uh, get out there, protest, uh, tell your governors to uh, you know, reform police brutality and uh, reform the police officers in general because they need to be defunded. They do not have billions of dollars in reserves. Um, and people that have mental health, go see a therapist, go talk to a friend, like it is not you know, wrong to get help, you know, you don't ever have to deal with anything by yourself, my music literally explains that you don't have to be alone in this shit, don't be with anyone that, like, puts you down, you don't have that negative in your life, that literally is the reason why you are in that position, and be yourself, love yourself, because I love you, and I need you to be you the way I am, the way I am, because everyone will love themselves better once they realize who they are and love themselves.